Salon again with one of my absolute heroes in the field and fantastically fabulous friend, uh, the one and only Randy Moggins. And I know for a fact that I need not give a bio for Randy because I think everyone that listens to me has somehow been connected to Randy. <laughs> And so I, I, I hope, though, in the outer world, and I'll, I'll let, we're going to get into some of Randy's background, actually. Uh, if you do not know who Randy Moggins is in Off Planet Media, Off Planet Radio, you are missing out for sure. This is top of the line, baby, and it does not get better. This is, Randy was probably going to hate me saying this, but Randy's in the category for me with the one and only Art Bell. Welcome, Randy. Hey, thanks. I'm blushing. I'm kind of the Rorschach test for people's uh, inner landscapes anyway. So, yeah, there's that. Well, I'm glad I got a blush out of you. <laughs> you did. It is so nice. We've been playing tag and you are out there doing incredible work. As always, your bar never lowers. Um, and you, you just continue to make it higher and more... Uh, through this time, through these times we're going through right now, which is, I'm saying that because we're going to get into all this, our our theme is prophecy. Uh, you have kept a very high standard in your transmissions and what you have been putting out on social media as well, cutting through bullshit as always. And I appreciate that. And I know a lot of people appreciate that in this time of cancel culture and people not listening much and just reacting to any word that they're triggered by. You have kept it up. And I appreciate that as a person in the world, let alone a friend. So welcome aboard. How have you been, Randy? I have been in just about every way you can be because <laughs> the energies of the time are uh, roiling through our, our our constructs right now at such a, a, a high frequency and rate that um, pretty much every minute we're sort of pressed to adaptively respond to the milieu as it's moving and shifting. Yes. So I find myself in that place too. It's uh, somersaults and cartwheels. <laughs> it sure is. I it's I'm constantly there's almost every day where I'm like, no. No. You know there's like something where I'm like, really this, this there's something new that just kind of pauses gives me pause. And and it could be someone that I thought I knew that you know is all of a sudden just not someone i thought i knew to crazy events i wanted to start here with getting just a little of your background in in our topic here in prophecy you have quite a background in within this subject yeah, the, the the background is my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are people, and I've had this conversation with a number of people, especially in the last few years as we've kind of zoomed into this present reality, where we knew um, we were born for this time. And the sense of destiny of being born and understanding that we were in something that 
I've always kind of looked at as the end of the age, the end of the world, the world as a system. And if you haven't looked around lately, you might want to because the system's kind of kind of crashing. <laughs> and so here we are, and you know, I'm 50 years down the road, and I'm still almost like that child who first started reading the books of Daniel and Revelation in the in the scriptures and going, whoa, this feels ominously familiar in some way. What is that? And you know, I, I grew up, I've always said I'm kind of a hybrid. I grew up 50% fundamentalist Christian and 50% uh, Masonic occultism. And that has actually really served me well. It's meant that I could flow back and forth between what's conceived to be two different worlds in terms of a, of a world view. And I remember reading the book of Revelation. I, I read a fifth Bible probably a half dozen times in its entirety over the years. And then doing the work that I've been doing online for the last, oh gosh, I hate to say 18 years, first on shortwave radio and then later on the internet, doing Bible prophecy. I've never failed to be amazed at how accurate my initial feelings were as a kid of reading the book of Revelation and, and the shivers going up my spine, not understanding then what I understand now in terms of how we interpret these works and having a wider context coming at it from not just the, we would say, fundamentalist standpoint, the Gnostic view, uh, the view of what we call the occult, the... Um, the wider scale of, of, of prophetic, because obviously prophecy is something that's been practiced in our world since the beginning of our world. It's man's quest to connect back to the mind of God and understand his own beginnings and, frankly, his own ends. And that's the quest of prophecy. So I've studied it my whole life. I've sort of integrated it into almost everything that I've done, especially in media. Um, in the late 90s, I was deeply enmeshed in, in Christianity and wound up going to a, a school that was run by a pastor in my region here, and it was a school of prophecy. And I, I was uh, ordained in that church as a prophetic minister to operate in the office of the prophet, which <laughs> anybody that knows me, um, what an amalgam that is. Um, what I learned about prophecy and what I learned about the office of the prophet is that the prophet is a psychic, he is a teacher, he is a foreteller, he is a person who warns, sometimes standing outside the gates, as you'll see Jeremiah or Ezekiel do in the Old Testament of the scriptures, they're literally standing outside the gates warning of the impending armies that are coming. And that is the spirit that informs prophecy because prophecy looks forward and it, and it points to events and it, it, it has a scheme to it that outlines a, a direction that a people are going. And we've been in this mode on this world in fulfilling what I'll call certain prophetic outlines since probably the beginning of the 20th century, and certainly from the mid part of the 20th century forward. And we've been in what I call the spiral because it's tightening loops. And as we've gone down the gauntlet of time in the 20th century and now into the 21st century, that loop is getting tighter and tighter. And so my background informs what I do in terms of how I view my output, which at the current time, <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting things going on right now in the background. <clears throat> so as you know, I started in 2019, the series, The Eye of the Needle, which from the beginning I said was, if not prof for prophetic, was foreshadowing in terms of things that I sensed coming, didn't know what exactly they were, but by 
certainly by the beginning of 2020 was pretty obvious what was what was unfolding that we were in a great battle and um the eye of the needle was really me returning back to prophecy in a way that integrated a much wider knowledge base than I had at the time that I did my original show, which was the threshing floor, which ran from 2003 to around 2010. Interestingly enough, at the beginning of 2021, I, I got a phone call from my old partner in the threshing floor, Sue Patterson, who I'd worked with until 2010. And it was circumstances at that time that removed Sue from basically continuing to do what had been our partnership for the previous seven years. Seven years is always, seven's always an interesting number. Yes. Um, so here we are 10, 11 years down the road and Sue calls me and begins to regale me with what she's getting in terms of downloads about the events that transpired forward from the election in the in November of uh, 2020 forward to what's been called the great insurrection of Donald Trump on December 6th of 2020 and then going forward into um, the inauguration on January 20th of 2021 lots of 20s there and Numbers are important in prophecy. Yes. Um, she began to get a download that we had, in fact, gone into a new cycle of, of prophecy as she interprets it, which is, let's just say that her interpretation is a bit more narrow and her, um, her tools are very defined as opposed to mine, which were a more wider scale. And so as of January, we restarted the threshing floor after a 10-year silence. And I think that's interesting because it means that people have been activated supernaturally as watchmen for what is breaking out on every level of the society right now. I find this extremely profound. The word activation has really been coming up a lot for me in terms of many different aspects uh, through my life and what's going on in the public. And I think that it's something that needs to really be looked at closer as to what that can mean. And it also is tied into sleeper cells and we're starting mm -hmm. to hear some of this uh, verbiage out in the world again in the way that now we're able to see what that means. So in the stuff that we talk about with people, sleeper cell comes up, but now we're seeing people actually being activated, sleeper cells mm -hmm. being activated. Yeah. The energetics of the time, again, things will be along the lines of how people are wired, and that may actually be literal in terms of mind control operations. <laughs> For real. Um, energetically, there's a lot of different layers to it. We fundamentally, as human beings, have a split consciousness, which is actually triadically split into the conscious, subconscious, unconscious, and then the higher layer of that, which is the superconscious, which is the collective consciousness. And it is on the layer of the superconsciousness that the activation first began. I was tracking this in 2019 with the Saturn, Pluto, and Capricorn conjunction that occurred uh, on January 12th of 2020, not coincidentally, right around the same time that we began to see COVID begin to seep into the public notice, largely coming out of Wuhan. Mm -hmm. That energetic pulse at that time was accompanied by a massive cosmic wave that shot in from outside of the solar system through the sun down into the earth, 
was tracked by astronomers in Eastern Europe and recognized that at that time we began to see wild fluctuations in the magnetosphere on the Earth's magne magnetic grids as well. And um, the Schumann residents began to just go completely batshit crazy. Yeah. Uh, those energies were cosmic waves that were sent in as activations from, let's just say, our guardians, the galactic beings who are what you would even call stars, mm -hmm. um, that were long anticipated by the mystery schools going back to the early 1900s. This is um, some of the mystery school writings that had been held in reserve that had been re revealed in recent years by uh, people like um, Helena Rorick, who was uh, a later part of the mystery school that produced uh, Blavatsky. Mm. And there was a strong prophetic movement in the mystery schools that stated, first off, that we had begun to enter this age. We're in a shifting age. We're not, we're actually right now in the, what I'll call the interregnum between Pisces and Aquarius. And where those delineations are exactly, we don't know, but it's a long cycle. The cosmos moves in cycles that are much, much longer than human beings really can calculate because our lives are so short. You know, we look at a lifetime that maximally is probably about 100 years, but we're talking about cycles that run in, you know, 100,000 year cycles, 12,000 year cycles, 25,000 year cycles. So where an age begins and ends exactly isn't definitive from our standpoint, but it doesn't matter. The energies themselves are beginning to aggregate. And these cosmic waves have been pulsing us in waves, certainly since the mid 20th century, 1948 forward, and with more rapidity and greater intensity since the 1960s. So you had things like um, the harmonic convergence. Um, you had this great push towards 2012 and, and the end of the um, Mesoamerican calendar, with the, what's called the Mayan calendar. You had all this convergence of energy and expectations that centered on 2012. And then going forward, what I began to track was cycles that were growing much shorter, both growing shorter in occurrence and more intense in their levels of energy running out in cycles of 12, 7, and 5 years overlapping, much like a spiral, just as a spiral moves and it will overlap itself, but it's closing a loop tighter and tighter, and that's exactly what you see. And I'm trying to paint word pictures here so that the listener can get a sense of how the energies work, because the spiral is the most concise way to understand the energetics, and it's an easy way to visually grasp exactly where we're at. If you consider the wide end of the spire, spiral would have been just to benchmark at 1900, very wide spirals going through to 1948. We've gone through two world wars now. We're entering the 1960s, the 1970s, the revolution that that was. We ramp up into the 1980s, and we have about a 25-year period between... 1987 to 2012, which is a period of unprecedented rapid growth technologically and societally in not just Western culture, but world culture. The world got smaller. It got faster. It got more intense. Technology became the dominant um, icon of our time. We had been in the industrial age for several hundred years, you know, 300 years or so. And we became post-industrial. We moved through this technological era from the mid-1980s forward into uh, 2000, 2010s. 
we're actually now post technological as well because the technology itself is being subsumed into the next level of this which goes into the genetic layers which is where we are now that's a lot that's a lot to digest it is and i want to get to those genetic layers in the second hour so just to get a little more hammered down here Let's look at the idea here of collective consciousness and super consciousness. I want to kind of hone in on this fundamentalist idea of God. Where is God? So I guess, all right, for me, I guess I just pointed myself towards what I think is God. (laughs) As a fundamentalist and in the fundamentalist paradigm, what is God? In the fundamentalist paradigm and in most religious paradigms, God is an external. God is something out there, and God has been humanized. He's been personified. He's been put into a human form. That's literally what you see in the three monotheistic religions in some form or another, certainly in Christianity, because you see the Son of God— who would be personified as Yeshua or Jesus or Issa, coming to earth as, quote, the Savior. You have the same thing with Muhammad and the Islamic religion as well. The idea that God is transformed into human form creates, again, kind of an icon for humans to access as something accessible because God Themself, I will say that because we have turned God into a man, and yeah, you know, <laughs> that, that's a very, very loaded situation in terms of my own theology. So, them, they, uh, Christianity holds to a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but really. When you drill down into the religions themselves, and this goes way back into any of the religions, pick one, going back to Hinduism, Buddhism, some of the interim religions, um, Zoroastrianism, these religions had a God that was ineffable. It was unexplainable, which I'm comfortable with because I think any God that you can explain is no God at all. Having said that, when I come back to the teachings in Jesus, Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is within you. Well, if God's in the kingdom of heaven, then clearly God must be within you, and that's actually what all these religions do say. When you cut past all the verbiage and all the religious ornamentation that goes into them, This is an inner journey. It's an inner journey because of something we now understand in this century as fractalism or the holographic concept that the smallest part contains the entirety of the whole. Something that, you know, this is where science has served us. The quantum physics has given us access to at least the imagery to understand concepts so that years ago our consciousness couldn't contain. Yeah. So what God is and what God is not, God is not some man with white hair on a golden throne in the sky, surrounded by angels casting down thunderbolts to blast the disobedient creation, which he had damned as being guilty of original sin, going back to the Genesis Of mankind. That's what God is not. And we can prove that because the only place you can look for God ultimately is inside of yourself anyway. We do that. That's called prayer and meditation. We can take these books, these external books, we can use them as a, I guess, a matrix to weave concepts to understand something about it But at the end of the day, when everything's said and done, it is you alone within your temple. The temple is the two temples between which your mind, your brain, your consciousness sits. 
And that is the holy place. That's actually literally the holy place that's described inside the New Testament of the Bible as well. The black book, the black cube. <laughs> I can, you know, in a lot of ways, I wind up deconstructing Christianity even as I embrace it because I understand it for what it is. And, you know, so what God is, is God is inside of you. He's inside of each one of us. And that's hard to accept when you look at the world. Um, all of a sudden, you're now thrust into a situation where you go, but, but this person's a pedophile. They're a rapist. They're a banker. They're a corrupt politician. And you're going, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're left with the conclusion that we live in a world of incredible dichotomy, black and white, dark, evil, and yet at the same time understanding that all of this emanated from a single source and what we are going through is both the separation of God from itself back to the one through a very arduous process inside of something we call time. That was a long way around answering your question. Oh, but it is specific. And so it brings up many things. For one, I did not know I wasn't raised reading the Bible. And of course, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm knee deep in it now. I, I'm really enjoying it. I did not realize that the eye of the needle was right out of the Bible. It's out of the Bible by, yeah, it's referential. I actually think the, the, the actual allegory there that's being cited by Jesus was a much older saying that probably goes back to even the, the Persian culture, as I've traced it back. It's a very, very old metaphor. And it has a lot of different meanings. I mean, for me, it was just, when I selected that, it was sort of unconscious. I've gone back, I actually was listening to an older show and realized that I had used the term many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was sitting there, on the shelf, I guess, waiting to be plucked down and, and oh, activated. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> activated. That's it. <laughs> well, it's absolutely perfect. And what you just said is what I'm discovering and why I'm loving the canon so much is that the canon really came together and is part of, it was really an al amalgamation of all this other stuff. And we see this really with the idea of God and I grew up with the idea of God as the old man on the, as Zeus, but it was called God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I had this realization, Randy, I, it about knocked me over. I'm like, wait, this image that I just assumed, you know, I mean, that was always just the image of God. And when I realized and learned about who Zeus was, I had, that was that one of those Satori moments where it's like, Wait, 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 wait. So in the Holy Bible, that God is really taking on the Zeus form for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's all archetypal anyway. Yes. It's, it's the, like I said, it's the scheme through which we see things. Um, the New Testament calls it through the glass darkly. That's what the Apostle Paul called it. Because we're, we're really seeing shadows and forms. And those shadows and forms are brought into our consciousness as a way to understand something that conceptually we have not been mature enough as a race to understand up until now to our complete detriment. We've had all manner of gods enter into this world, um, alien invaders, alien energies, interdimensionals that have used this against us to exploit us as a race of people and to corrupt us repeatedly over and over into cycles of destruction. And so we associate God with destruction. We associate God with, if you look at the book of Revelation and you just read it on its face, it looks like God's really pounding the living hell out of the world <laughs> in the book of Revelation. And it's punishment, yeah. And you're like, punishment for what? How many innocent millions of people need to die in the name of this God? And this was twice where I walked away from this religion because I went, I don't want to worship this God. Look at him. He's a war God. Yeah. Go back and read the bloody battles that they fought 
when Israel was being formed, till they went into the lands and they slaughtered entire races of people, pillaged them, looted them, burned them to the ground, displaced them, erased them from history. You want to talk about cancel culture? Man, you got nothing <laughs> when this God. And I understood later on as I studied more and as I got a wider view that um, there's a lot of things you have to separate out in understanding what has been represented of God, including some of the God's plural, who are represented in the Old Testament of that Bible. There were multiple gods there, and the, the Hebrews were clearly polytheistic in one sense. You have the Elohim, you have all of these El gods that show up. You have a race of people who fall repeatedly time and time again into idol worship. They're literally burning their children on the altar of Baal. Oh. They're, they're doing uh, rituals to Molech. Uh, they clearly lost their balance so many times along the way in understanding who it was that was, we would say, the founder of their race. God is a very complex subject, and it's made complex by the fact that we, well, we don't have an accurate recounting of the original events of our own origins. If ever they and them really did apply for me, it is in context to the idea of God. It is the way I've always internally felt about that energy. Now, I have always come from the feminine side, and so it was, yeah. it was always about the Great Mother for me internally, just before I knew anything about religion, that the Great God the bigger, the big G. It's almost an insult to apply gender to something that huge, that all-prevailing, and <clears throat> that encompasses and is permeated through every bit of text we have, all oral histories we have. And this is sometimes where I look back and think, about what was putting me off from becoming a Christian. And it was some mm -hmm. of that idea that you already brought up was, well, this is a nasty God. I mean, it, he's jealous, he's spiteful. It's also, it was this idea of him for me that I never could understand with the gendering. And I had to come to terms with what that was for me internally as a person struggling with a lot of different issues. In your personal life, especially before you get to, say, Saturn return, talk about another god that is similar, mm -hmm. things are very myopic. It's very about your process in the world, and your, there's still a long ways to look ahead, but you've come, you feel at that time at least, you feel like you've come a long way by the age of 27, <laughs> <laughs> which is so laughable to me now. But Suddenly I want a Virginia Slim. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Suddenly I just want to uh, remind myself, like I was in a state of physical perfection at 27, and I'm thinking I was, you know, already old and wise. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> without the idea of of this construct of aging that helps us process a bigger meaning out of all this it's part it's it's baked into this kind of evolutionary personal experience if you allow it to take you there and this god felt constricting to me and i had no idea so that whole satori that it was being co-opted from these other pantheons. And at that time, what was important to me? Well, what was I going to do for my, what was I going to do to make a living? What I, I wanted to do? I, I, I. And I was very invested in the things that I was invested in that were not spiritual. They may have seemed spiritual and I may have presented myself that way. But looking back now, I can see that that's not completely true, and that I had a personal egoic interest in those things. And that's just being very candid, you know, many years removed from 27. So, if you unpack that a little bit, as a female person, yeah, as a person who's biologically female, yeah, there's nothing there. 
you have a male represented God, you have a male represented Messiah, and even worse, you have a male represented Holy Spirit yes. within the accepted Trinity of the church as we know it. This was my criticism, and I actually did something about this. I went back and started to look at the scriptures again in the Old Testament, and specifically uh, the writings in Ecclesiastes, the Solomonic writings. And I discovered Sophia, and I discovered that Sophia was very consistent with the person of the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's the name of the show that I did. It's still online on my Podomatic Threshing Floor site. Uh, I pissed a lot of people off with this (laughs) because I basically said in order to have a balanced Godhead, the feminine must be present. You cannot have an all with, it's like, what is this? Is this like an underground homosexual club or something? Not that there's anything (laughs) wrong with that. I'm just saying you have a God that's completely represented by a male genderized identity. Yes. Whereas the feminine, the feminine is the creative. We understand that. I mean, if you look at the symbols around us and you <laughs> look at the Mercury symbol, the caduceus, the, the rose and the cross, the veneration of Mary is, is an offshoot of this. It was, it, was, it was really the demand for somewhere in all this to be balanced. And when I began to look at wisdom in the Old Testament is written by Solomon. Wisdom is Sophia. Wisdom is the intuitive, creative, feminine aspect of the Godhead. It's personified there, and then when it comes forward into the New Testament in the book of Acts, it is this great wind that comes in that conceives of the church, the right, the proper church, what the church would have been had it not been corrupted by politics. Um, But the driving force behind it was this wind of the spirit, which was the person of the Holy Spirit, was was this divine creative force, which we would call Sophia. You know, for me, this was so liberating. I've struggled for my entire life to balance between the feminine and the masculine. I mean, I'm very aware of how I present. I'm very aware of my own my own expressions in terms of being somewhat feminine as a male person. And that can create incredible social anxiety, certainly in the age I was growing up in, but you know, now it's, it's improved. But the identity behind it is the idea that we balance this Godhead in such a way that the feminine is not just represented but actually the feminine needs to be elevated and the energies of aquarius which is rising and is why we're in such a struggle societally is attempting to balance that again i mean it's certainly what we saw come out of the distortions of the women's movement of the 1970s and what we see roiling through the system in terms of this battle between the two genders and now the battle within human beings with their own genders. And it's not lost on me that this great controversy over transgender people is occurring now and that it's manifesting itself in children. While I do think there's a fair amount of social programming that's gone into this that is creating distortion i believe humanity is at the place where children are coming in shuffling an identity that they understand isn't strictly male or female anymore and i think that's again another icon we have to look at seriously this will this will roil some people's feathers as well but i think you have to look at human beings and understand we're complex we're on a spectrum and that We have suffered in our civilizations under the heel of the masculine for so long that now the masculine simply has to step back for a while, allow the feminine to rise again, the energy, not the gender, the feminine energy to arise 
and then we can rebalance again. But before that can happen, we're going to go through a lot of turmoil internally and as a society. So this is, this is all very important because understanding God in a balanced way, creator in a balanced way, demands that we understand the role of the feminine and all of it. Absolutely. And I see it this way too with the, the enteodromia aspect of it, the swinging of the pendulum of extremes to get to that balanced state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this ties into our subject of prophecy. So within that, we could guess and we could look forward. And I definitely remember doing this talking about the idea of the Age of Aquarius back in the 80s. And I was involved with a lot of, I guess, uh, loosely Wiccan stuff. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I Mm -hmm. was never... Which is a very feminine... Yes. Which is a very feminine religion. I was never comfortable with that title, though. So it always seemed a little too New Agey for me. And I never really over-identified with the New Age movement. So I was very much into the darker female aspect of it Mm -hmm. and tried to carry that forward. However, when we look at prophecy, and prophecy, when people hear prophecy, they really a lot of times want to go straight to the Bible. The idea of prophecy is ancient, and it permeates every culture. So when we're looking at moving into Aquarian realities, where we are here and now, there was always this idea that the female aspect was going to rise up and take its place with that whole function of an antiodromia. The pendulum is indeed swinging. And so fast forward to where we are and what we're seeing, and I'm glad you brought up the uh, transgendered experience going on and how it's really we're seeing it within the new souls coming in. And Mm -hmm. this is a very, a big, a big deal. And it's not lost on me either, Randy. And I wanted to talk about this actually through prophecy. So is it in there across the board that we would see how that inner reflection, outer reflection, that which is, coming forward into the age of Aquarius would play out in this way through the, the kids coming in, claiming Z and Zay and all of this stuff that is realigning our ideas of what gendering is. On a strict sense, even Paul, the apostle, considered now to be the model of conservatism, within fundamentalism states in in the book of Romans, there is therefore now neither male nor female. That's That's a big one, yeah. Worship the Bible might want to look at that one. It's huge. Yeah. There's a correction, course correction that is occurring. The female plays a huge part in the fulfillment of prophecy in the book of Revelation. There are feminine figures there. There's two. And one of them is somewhat hidden. And I'll tell you how this works. It is the woman in the wilderness in the book of Revelation, uh, the man-child, the birth of the man-child. If you look that up, you can even plug it into Google. And the man-child is depicted in the book of Revelation as the birthing of this new age. And as the woman who is called into the wilderness on, quote, the wings of an eagle, where she flies for time, and time, and half time. So, however you view that, there's that's a, amazing, there's a right there. there. Yeah, um, and she is nurtured there, and it says that the waters that the dragon spit out waters. The dragon would be this force at the end of the age. He seeks to kill the man child. He seeks to kill the new creation, the new man. And it says the, war, the earth helps the woman. The earth is there in that book of Revelation depicted as a conscious living entity. And from my perspective, earth, Gaia, Sophia, is feminine. And so no birthing occurs on that side of the veil without this very strong female vibration coming through. When I came in, it was very clear to me that this was 
I mean, as soon as I could really start functioning and the way my life was set up was, of course, how I viewed my mother. And this happens with a lot of us, right? With our parent, whoever our parent rental figures are. And to me, she was always the great goddess. You could not tarnish this woman. There was no, I did this later <laughs> egoically. <laughs> But for half my life, which, you know, she was dead by half of my life, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She, she represented everything that I could ever want to be as a woman was in my mother. And uh, good, bad, ugly, all of it. And, and we, could, we could fold the trinity in there, right? The female trinity, the mother, maiden, and crone. The mother aspect, people forget, is a hard aspect. Mothering is not mm. all loving. <laughs> people get lost in this. No. And if we want to think about that, too, with the mother of God, the mother of the universe, there's a coldness there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That ties into actually the idea of bloodlines as well, because when we think about like serpents as mothers, the mother serpent, the mother serpent in general is a cult, you know, they oftentimes birth live babies and let them go. And in turtles, where they, you know, they lay their eggs, a lot of this in nature happens. They lay their eggs and they move on and the babies are off on their own when they hatch or come to. And for some things, they're feeding frenzy. For other, you know, so for the few that make it and get past that gauntlet of of early childhood, and it is a gauntlet. It is for humans, too. We just don't recognize it sometimes because we're culturally conditioned to accept and to be with the idea that our parents are going to take care of us until we're 18 in our culture, and or 21, or some always do. Uh, and then we're out in the world, but we had a safe upbringing, and they were supposed to teach us how to get along, the ropes. Well, in nature, it's not quite like that, Randy. It's rare, actually, to see that the mothering process is so involved as it is with Homo sapiens. And so this coldness that comes in is something that we need to embrace with the mother archetype and also with the feminine archetype. So whereas we have... The dark side and the warring side of the God energy, we have that in the female side too. We have Athena, we have Diana, I mean, we have fierce women that are outside of the canon that found their way in the canon through Mm -hmm. different females that are famous in there that are kind of um, ostracized or demonized in a way. And of course, there's no better example in mythology, I think, than than some of the great Gorgons like Mud. Medusa, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Here's a beautiful maiden that's turned grotesque and you can't even look upon her. <laughs> I mean, what is this dynamic that's going on with us internally? And how are these ideas playing out prophetically? And then we look at what's going on in our current society and we bring this to the ground we're standing on in the reality we're playing in and it starts to open the mind up more and gets us out of the text and out of reading flat lines of verbiage of symbols you know on a page and into our life plato really came in with this idea of okay this is all great but here we are and you're living here and now what are you going to do with all this these stories and to kind of get into wrapping up this first hour i wanted to come back into that transgender thing because i have and love so many transgendered people around i love them and yeah. but in my life it was a very rare thing and now it's a very common thing and i have peers that are struggling with children that are in the middle of that. They're mm-hmm. saying, mm-hmm. I'm not this and I'm not that. And the thing that's scaring most of them is, uh, I don't care about you thinking I should pass as a female because I don't even identify as a female. This is for male-born children. Like, they don't even care. It doesn't bother them. Now, transgenders in my life really try to assume the other role, right? That they were feeling internally 
and uh, that they knew they were internally, that the essence of what they were was not what they were biologically uh, manipulating their suits, their vessels, their starships. And so now we have this whole section, and it's very broad and it's very big, of Sol saying, I'm not, I'm not either. And by honing me in and by pigeoning me in, you are functioning within your paradigm. And now this is what's splitting up families in a big way. And yes, we're stripping aside the agenda the political, the geo agenda with this and the, the cracking of the egg in that sense of trying to pit mm, people against yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. I want to look at just this, this concept of the changing, evolving human through prophecy and how it was seen, how the angels, the angelic orders are not given genders. That's right. That's right. They're not, neither male nor female. But I notice a lot of people will fight against that idea. Right. Well, the romantic period of, you know, the Raphael period of, of portraying curly haired cherubs. And then, of course, these uber masculine warrior angels were not served by that imagery because, again, you're humanizing beings who sit outside the construct of our limitations of a physical body and a physical space and in time. The creation trends back to what you would call the hermaphrodite. Um, yes. It goes back to the concept of fully contained within our consciousness are both the masculine and feminine, feminine aspects, which is somewhat separate from how we externalize. I mean, I think one of the valid arguments, and, and I've talked to a lot of transgender people, including people who identify as gender non-binary, is that within our consciousness, the expressions of all these things lay to one degree or another dormant. And in this generation, there is, again, kind of this quickening that's occurred where people have come in that don't identify as their genitalia or their their semblance in any way they understand the inner nature of it more from the perspective of who they feel they really are i had a dream a few years ago where it was basically revealed to me that i had never been incarnated as a male before which was you know quite mind-blowing mm -hmm. and that in this life I've sort of fought against this. I've sort of fought against my own nature. And I'm, I'm revealing a little bit about myself here, but I'm fine with that. Because I'm comfortable with the fact that, first off, how I express on the masculine scale is basically how I'm perceived. And yet at the same time, that's not exactly entirely who I am in terms of my inner landscape, which oftentimes tends to be more feminine. How we present, how we appear to the world is an identification. It's an identification based on our physical presentation. It has nothing to do with the inner soul, which can pulse as both either or neither male or female, as we recognize in male, male and female gender models. Because all of that are constructs of society the concepts that men do this and women do that and we dress this way and we look that way in the 70s when i was a young person i did a lot of gender bender i mean it was the era of bowie and lou reed and uh, the new york dolls and oh, yes. this wild <laughs> early goth scene that was going on punk so fabulous and glitter <laughs> and I was living in New York City at a time when this was this was the underground culture and being able to live in that for a while gave me a perspective on people I met some of my first transgender associates people that I, I got to know including some of the people who were part of the early uh, house movement uh, if you saw the women in the clubs you would have never 
assigned a masculine identity to them. Right. Um, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. They were beautiful. Yeah. And it plays with your head for a while, especially if you're a male who's been raised in a culture of male privilege and specifically men that have been raised in cultures that promote the idea of the masculine privilege and the masculine imperative that women are somehow subservient to men. And then you discover this energy that comes out of someone who presents as feminine in such a powerful way that it takes your breath away, that you have to re-examine everything you know about identity, sexuality, and how we present to the world the inner landscape of our own beingness. And that's where we're at now as a culture. We're being confronted with this. Yeah, we're being confronted with it and expanding upon it. And like I'd said earlier, it was, you know, it was more in the beginning, it was this going to the other side, so to speak. And now that it's this, no, wait, it's both and more. It's bigger. And when we actually go back and we look, we can see that our roles as male and female were an agenda as well. And that through the propaganda machines that are early on, this was the role of a female. This was the role of a male. And this is why I brought up the darker side of the mother, especially, Mm -hmm. because the mother can be... The dark side of the mother can be more fierce than any warrior. I mean, the dark side of the mother is a warrior, right? And so how is that, stripping that away, how is that any different except for we gender it? Well, society has demanded that we identify as one or the other. Society has demanded that we choose, or it's been chosen for you. I mean, the, the whole reason behind this language of assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth is to break this concept. And because there are intersex people out there, there are people who are born with both. And yes. the concept that we have hardwired identities to chromosome and, and genitalia means that we have a model forced upon us, which may not be consistent with the internal landscape of our own knowingness of who we are. And that requires an awareness of yourself that a child will develop only because it's so acutely aware of how it conflicts against the constructs that have been presented to us, that there is a third and fourth way to do this. And that it's been there all along. That's the thing. It's been there all along. <laughs> yeah, it's been there all along. Because <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, the cultures have shown us that there were men who utilized feminine identities and there were women who used masculine identities to penetrate into places where they couldn't have gotten with their own presumed identities. Um, very interesting. It's interesting and it's profound. And the more this struggle happens with this uh, kind of prophesized ascension of sorts or this prophesized destruction and revealing mm-hmm. is a key here. And it's something that I wanted to definitely touch upon. I don't want to dwell upon it, you know. The whole show's not about transgender. I think we went, I actually liked where we went. It was an opportunity to discuss that. Yeah. I'll just point something out to you in terms of prophecy of my own symbolism. The needle is a very interesting symbol because the needle is a penetrative phallic object, but at the end of that is an ovum. Mm -hmm. And without the ovum, (laughs) The phallus is useless because the thread has to go through the oven to penetrate the matrix that the needle is traveling through. That is deeply profound. And talk about painting a picture with words. This is a perfect place to, uh, in this first segment and session with Randy Moggins. Randy, how do people find you in the world? 
Right now, the best place is probably on YouTube, at least for as long as I have it. YouTube.com forward slash off planet media. The website is offplanetradio.com. That's currently down as being be- rebuilt. And patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. Thank you so much for coming to the Cosmic Salon again. And I look forward to the second hour. We're going to really dive deep here. And of course, we already have. So I'll see you on the other end. Thank you, everyone that is listening. And there he goes, the one and only Randy Moggins, one of my favorite people on planet. I would like to thank the producers of this show, Christy Tesmer, Jason Lamson, Marcy Shapiro, Marin Kramer, Melanie Poe, Michael Watcher, and Santa Rebecca, as well as Patrick Newland. I think it's important as we start looking at these ideas of our construct in a personal sense as far as perhaps these starships that we're navigating, our bodies, and what we identify with and to and identify uh, in deeper ways that could be detrimental to our overall soul, soul growth. Gender is a hot topic these days. and it, it always actually has been, but it's become a hot topic because it's got ground now. It's got feet, and this is part of this Aquarian switch we're going through in this procession of uh, the equinoxes. And so it is uh, expected to rise up and have us question our realities and have us question what we are and who we are and what we think and how we feel concerning this idea of gender identity. So all the politics aside, it is important to remember, in my opinion, that we are more than anything we identify with. We're outside of that realm. (laughs) 